What I saw this morning, I saw part of the presentation, was that your work has a lot to do clearly with resilience. Mm -hmm. So if you could talk to me a little bit about how you define resilience, that would be helpful. Well, the main way I look at resilience is the capacity for people who have faced adversity to bounce back and to cope much more effectively with life. So really, I, I see it as people who really have very good coping strategies, if you will. And they also have an optimistic attitude. They feel that even though they have faced difficult times, that there are ways that they could overcome them, and that a basic part of that is also to have people in their lives who can be of assistance during the process. And that's why I love to talk about uh, the late psychologist Julia Siegel's notion of a charismatic adult, that we all need a charismatic adult, someone from whom we gather strength. And for me, this is a main role that coaches and psychologists, parents uh, can play, so that the person gathers strength, feels that, okay, I'm having some difficult times, but there can be better times ahead but what also the charismatic adult does is really to help the person see that they have within themselves the resources to start to make these changes. Great. Can you give me an example, an example of, of a charismatic adult in a situation? One of, one of my favorite examples actually was told to me at a workshop. Uh, a, a woman who was a high school teacher came up to speak with me afterwards and she told me uh, actually that her parents were not her charismatic adults. They always put her down and they uh, never accepted her really. And during her high school years, one day a teacher came up to her in the hallway who, she was in the teacher's class, but she said, I didn't even know the teacher knew me because she was somewhat of a withdrawn girl. And the teacher said to her, I have something to say to you. Uh, don't even think of responding right now. And he said, I hope someday you see the good in yourself that I see in you and someday you realize what a lovely, competent person you are. And she said maybe if he had said it a year before, it would not have made the impact, but she said that was one of the first compliments she has ever received and it just changed her life. And today she said because of him she became a high school teacher and it also gave her greater confidence. It also showed me that sometimes someone could come into your life just for a brief time, say even one, you know, make one comment, but it hits you in a certain way, a very positive way, and, and you're ready to hear it and to make changes. And a fabulous example, thank you. Sure. That's exactly the kind of thing. Um, and in your own work, um, is part of it assisting people in mining those memories and bringing that forward for themselves? Well, uh, what, what I try to do in my own work, if I'm using the concept of charismatic adult, I will always ask my adult patients questions like, you know, who, who are the charismatic adults in your life today? Who are you a charismatic adult for? Who are those important people? And what did they say or do that made them your charismatic adult and are you saying or doing some of the same things for other people because we we can take those experiences and not to make you know them identical but we can use them to guide what we do today so it's not at all uncommon for me to ask people to think about those people in their lives who made a difference when i give workshops for teachers i always ask teachers to do the following think of a teacher you really loved what words would you use to describe that teacher? Just two or three words. Think of a teacher you did not like. What words would you use to describe that teacher? And now what words do you hope your students use to describe you? And what words would they actually use? So it gets you to start to reflect on, am I living life, if you will, in concert with my values? Am I serving as a charismatic adult? Um, uh, how would I be described? So it's a very important part of uh, my work. And would you work with this differently if you're working with an adolescent or with a child? Uh, uh, with an adolescent or a child, uh, it may be worded somewhat differently. With an adolescent or child, I might say something like, tell me, tell me a, about one adult or, uh, who you really like to be with, that you enjoy being with, and what do they say and do that makes them so enjoyable to be with? Tell me about an adult who you really don't like to be with as much. 
What did they say or do that makes it very difficult for you? So I, I, what I find, it's very helpful for people to get this contrast, the very positive, the very negative. Uh, it's not to build up these polarities, but for people to start to understand who are those people who are really supportive, and then what, do they, what can they learn from this? With adolescents, sometimes I'll say, well, think about you know, who was helpful to you, and maybe someday how are you going to be helpful? Because another part of resilience, which I often talk about, is resilient people are people who feel they make a positive difference in the world. It's, it's it, study after study, has, it, that's been a finding. Yeah, it, it's it's quite stunning, and and I love the uh, the idea of of creating a balance, not a polarity, you know, and and maybe overbalancing to the positive. Right. But that's that's counterintuitive for most of us. Yes, I, it, 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 well, you know, it's like I'm, I'm laughing. Said, you know. It's like, you know, I could do a workshop and you get 100 evaluations, 99 sound great, and one is really oh, not, what, so what do I think about? I mean, I'm, I get obsessed with that. I think about the one, like, why did this person like this? You know, but then I've learned over the years, you're not going to please everyone, and if most people like your message or you f they feel they've learned something, that's the most important thing. And there's a big piece of learning for all of us in that, too. Oh, you know, the natural inclination is to pick out the flaw. That's right. Interesting. Um, the other word that I saw that was, one of the other words that I saw that was key in your material was mindset. Mm -hmm. And can you, can you define that for me? Yeah. Well, I, I define, I, there may be many definitions, but I define mindset as these, these assumptions or expectations that we have for ourselves or others and I add the words that guide our behavior. That we all make uh, certain assumptions about ourselves, how we see ourselves and others, that we may not even be clear about, that we have these assumptions, but they will determine our behavior. If we don't feel very competent, say, in uh, a certain task, like I'm not very handy, and my wife knows if something's not working effectively in the house or broken, I always say, call someone. And even before I go in, I, I feel I'm not going to do a very good job. Now, thank heavens I can call someone. Uh, so there's a, the mindset that way, how we feel entering any uh, task. But there are mindsets about how we see other people. The example I gave this morning is if a, if a mother sees her daughter as uh, having a personal vendetta against her, then that mother is going to be more controlling and punitive. If the mother sees it, as she said, uh, the girl, a suffering child, then she's going to be more empathic and caring. So how we view things will play a major role then in our behavior. And uh, so the issue is a lot of people, though, they don't realize mindsets are assumptions. They're not necessarily the, rea the truth. And everyone thinks, th I shouldn't say everyone, people think they are always correct. But we have to challenge our mindsets. You know, when my son was underachieving in school, when I mentioned, I saw him as an underachiever. That was my mindset. And I was more punitive with him. But while he wasn't doing his homework, he was doing all these wonderful things like, you know, president of his youth group, doing volunteer work, whatever. And what I should have, my mindset should have been is, he is doing a lot of wonderful work. Okay, he's not doing all his homework, but he is not an underachiever. Because once I saw him as an underachiever, then my approach became more punitive rather than helping him with his strengths. And so I hear two things in it. It's very powerful. Um, one is that we have these assumptions, and maybe we're not paying attention to them. Maybe we don't even know that they're there. Maybe we do know that they're there, and as you say, we assume they're right. But they have a huge impact. Um, and just becoming aware that they're there, I would assume, is one stage. Um, but the second thing I think I heard you say is that broadening the view to see this is not necessarily reality, or even if it's real, it's not the only reality, right. would be a, a key task. Am I understanding you right? Yes. Uh, first of all, it, it, it is very important to be even aware that we have these assumptions and what they are to guide our behavior. A lot of my therapy and the, you know, uh, coaching is about that. But what I found, and I'm, I'm smiling when I say this because it's true of myself, is we sometimes don't challenge our assumptions because we just think this is the truth. 
this is reality. This person, you know, does have a personal vendetta against me, or this person doesn't, you know, like me at all, or, or whatever the case may be. But we have to remember this is an assumption. Those assumptions then play a role in how we behave. Some people I, I, I have actually told me I'm smiling again when I say this, well, but my assumptions are the truth. But that's not the reality. The reality is that we try to make the most sense out of what our assumptions are once we realize they're there. And once we understand that there are assumptions, then we're more open to change. It's when we don't even think that these are assumptions, but we just act believing these are just the truths and don't even realize they're assumptions that we're always then going to follow the same pattern of behavior rather than being more flexible. There's a fascinating link in here that I hadn't thought of before where, um, that you're giving me, which is that the assumption is actually the driver in a lot of ways of that behavior, even though it, it doesn't seem like it's that yeah. connected. It, uh, it's very cool. Well, it, no, it's very interesting you say that because in this, my PowerPoint, I, I, I make sure I added that, that basically that influence or drive our behavior, these assumptions and expectations. And we may not realize it, but they really do. This wonderful work in education that if you tell teachers there are a group of kids who are ready to just zoom ahead and do very well in school, the reality is they're going to do much better. And, some, and there is, some teachers will even say to me, but I didn't do anything differently. But they don't even realize it. They may smile more, they may be more supportive, or whatever. So it just, so it does drive. Very subtle. Very. Uh, it, it could be extremely subtle, uh, and it could be something like even, you know, a smile, or a little, paying a little more attention to a kid. Or if a child, one of the studies found, if a child asked, a, uh, if the teacher asked the child a question, and the child said, I don't know, if the teacher's assumption was that this is a kid who's just very motivated, ready to zoom ahead, how the teacher answered it was in this way. This was the teacher's mindset. Well, if this child doesn't know the answer, maybe others don't also, because I know this child's very motivated. So the teacher used it, it almost sounds corny, as a teachable moment, would say things like, let me go over this again. If the teacher's assumption was that the, the child really was unmotivated and didn't care, and asked the question and the child said, I don't know the answer, often the teacher would say things like, you really have to pay closer attention next time. Or we re review this. So it becomes much more punitive. So it, you not only that, but there's a lost opportunity. Exactly. Yeah. I, I, I kid someone and say, we lose a teachable moment. That teacher loses that teachable moment. Um, the, the vision and the mission of the Institute of Coaching is to build the scientific foundation and the evidentiary base of coaching. Um, can you talk a little bit about how your work is in line with that? It clearly is, but how would you yeah. see that? Well, what I try to do in my work, and certainly there are, you know, very honestly, there are a lot of people who do far more research uh, than I do. My work has been more applied and certainly relying on the research of others. But what I've tried to do in a very practical way is to look at the research and then I always ask, but how do you apply the research to the real world? And this has been an important part of my work. I mean, even in graduate school, I remember, my, you know, wonderful professors would give me theory, or wonderful supervisors, and my question always was, that sounds great, how do I really use it when I'm seeing a patient, you know? And, and it's the same thing here. When I started looking at theories of resilience and theories of motivation, I always direct, directed my attention to, okay, but what, what does this say or do? Uh, well, what, let me just say, I always directed my attention and looked, asked my question, but how does this help me to know what to say and do when I'm actually with someone? How does it guide the strategies I use? So it's important to have a research base, but as important as for that research base then to be able to be used in the real world uh, because else, you know, to me it would be meaningless. Research by itself that is not applied, this is my bias, is not very helpful. And then strategies that are not based or rooted at least in some research, some understanding, are just going to be sometimes I feel these chaotic, you know, strategies and we really don't know what is effective. So, you know, my focus on motivation and resilience, I really try to look at those theories 
that I find will be most applicable to the work I do. And, you know, very well researched theories, but I also want to take it to the step, how do we apply it? So, so to, to take a theory that seems persuasive to you, to reword, um, and take it out into practice and mm -hmm. work it and see and, and then report back mm -hmm. to yourself or, and I know you've written a number of books, mm -hmm. how does this actually work when I put it into practice? Well, I, it's one of the things years ago when I directed uh, one, the inpatient school in, in, at McLean Hospital, that was some of my beginning practices where I, I realized what I was doing wasn't working. I, I think I was too punitive, too many rules, and I started to think about, okay, what will help some of these really angry kids start to change? How do I create what I call a motivating environment? I didn't call it then, but I, how do I create motivation? So already I, I started looking at some components of what people were studying about motivation. So I said, okay, how can I apply this? You know, some would seem so obvious, but I wasn't using them. You know, how do you empower kids? How do you give them some choices? In discipline, how do you help them even create some of the rules uh, here? So I would read these things, and then it was great for me because I said, well, let me try this, or let me try this, or let me try this. And of course, success builds on success. All of a sudden, I, I was having uh, these experiences where some of these very angry kids, their discipline problems drop markedly. Uh, one of the research things I did when I was studying school climate was I found that one of the best memories people had of school was when they were asked to help out. Well, I said, boy, that seems like a very powerful kind of thing. You're requested to help out, and it leads to much more pro-social behavior. You're feeling better about yourself. So I said, how can I apply this? How do I apply it in doing therapy? How do I apply it as a father? You know, and it, it, what I loved was uh, that I found that the results were really good. And then, of course, one thing builds on another. I started sharing these ideas in you know, my writings and my lectures, and I would get these, you know, now they're emails, but letters before, people saying, you know, I tried this, and what a change this has, this has made. Some people might say, well, that's very anecdotal, but the ideas originally stemmed from some research I was reading, as well as my own intuition, and I'm not against anecdotal things either, because some of them are very personal, very poignant, very strong, and I learned just a, you know, a great deal. And, and then I looked at more research. So one thing built on another, and then I would try different strategies. Uh, and I said to parents, instead of telling your kid to do their chores, it's not just words, but really ask them to help you, help out. You need their help. And some parents said, that really made a difference. So I found even some of the requests, how you worded it, made a difference. So it was just lovely for me. And everything started coming together. The theory of motivation I was using, the theory of resilience I was using, it wasn't like they were all different theories far apart. They really came together for me, and I felt I had a much clearer sense of uh, what I was doing. And, uh, and then when you have to lecture or write about it, you better be clear, because the best way uh, to, to really learn is to teach, because you, you really have to put your thoughts, in, hopefully, in a coherent way. Well, and, and I, I, my own experience is if I teach, the questions that I'm asked from the audience or the students only add to my understanding of the subject that I'm presenting. That, what a wonderful point that is, because I always, that, I always tell people, whether the questions come a week later, because if some people like me, I don't think of the questions for a few days, but the questions or comments are extremely helpful. Like, just to give you a quick example, when I was giving workshops for parents on raising resilient children, one of the questions I was always getting was, Dr. Brooks, I have two or three kids. They're so different. And so what I did was, in one of my talks, I added a section on the different temperaments in kids from birth. That they, same gene pool, how different they are. Well, I thought people really knew this. It was such a popular segment that it, now it has remained in every talk I give for parents. Other things I dropped out, but I realized this was a very important thing. And it also helped me to say things like, we take too much credit for our kids' success and too much blame for our kids' difficulties. Kids come into this world 
with their own temperament. We're very influential, I say, but we really have to know what our child's unique needs and temperament is. So it's what you're saying. I get these questions, and I say, this is what's really on people's minds. And, and the work about temperament is fascinating mm -hmm. because, I mean, any parent, yes. you, you look at, at your two children, your six children, I don't care, yeah. they're, they're clearly different very. from the beginning. Yes. Um, and I think that it's very helpful, um, and I'm hearing you say this, to just remember how different they are, whether you're the parent or the teacher or the therapist. Mm -hmm. or it, it isn't one size fits all. I definitely not. I mean, I, I, I kid, I say two of the, you know, there was a husband and wife team, psychiatrist, Chess and Alexander, uh, who really studied temperament, and they became famous in the field of child development. They wrote a wonderful book, Know Your Child. They became famous because they came to this amazing conclusion, every child is different. And you know, parents in the audience laugh, and someone said, I could have told them that. I said, yeah, but they also developed a scale to measure the differences. But it was a major breakthrough. Like, the example I used with this girl with the mother uh, who thought the girl had a personal vendetta. I mean, it's, it felt that way, and the girl really had a difficult temperament. And part of my work was to change this mother's mindset and talk about temperament. And what I say is sometimes we, if we don't understand temperament, sometimes we say and do things, not out of malevolence, but out of really ignorance sometimes that may actually hurt our child. And we, we love our kids, but we may say or do things that hurt them. Like if you have a shy child and you think all you have to say, tell them is just speak to people and not realizing that as one seven-year-old in therapy said in a family meeting, don't you know if I could speak to people, I would? That you, you learn from that, yeah. If um, someone wanted to study your theories and your, your work more deeply, how would they do that? Uh, well, that's an interesting question. <laughs> well, I mean, there might be different ways. Certainly, uh, uh, through my writings, uh, you know, I, on my web, briefer articles on my website, there are over 125, and uh, books I've written, so that would be one way. Uh, I was, say, when I was at McLean Hospital as director of psychology and, you know, did a lot of supervision, it would be another way, but I really don't do that now, so what I say is, you know, I, I, I do courses, I do a week-long seminar every summer in Cape Cod about resilience across the lifespan where I really have a chance to share some of these ideas with much greater dialogue. So a lot would be through workshops or seminars and, and the writings that I uh, give. And some are through consultations I do. So if someone wanted to access that material, that would be on, the webs on your website? Oh, yeah. I, uh, all of my previous articles are posted, m much have to do with the questions you raised, actually. The, the great thing about writing for your own website is no one could reject <laughs> your articles. <laughs> I have my wife, because she's an excellent writer, she, she'll read them beforehand. But it's all, what you said before, a lot of my articles are based on feedback I get. Some people write and say, could you write an article about this or about this? And sometimes it'll just be from a popular magazine even. I say, oh, this is what people are reading, and I, I want to you know, maybe go into this a little more clearly. And then through some of the seminars and workshops, all of which are listed on my uh, website. Thank you so much. Oh, you're a great interview. You actually listen. No, you know, I've done a lot of, t no, because I've done a, a lot of, you know, years ago, especially I did on a regular basis two shows in Channel 5 when there was the, the Good Day show and Sunday Open House. And there are some people who, and I would often give the questions, I'd, I'd almost write the segments, and there, there would be some interviewers, it didn't matter what I would say, they weren't listening, they, they were looking to the next question, next, next. And others, you knew they were listening because they were really, they just picked up so nicely. So it was a pleasure. But of course, you're skilled at that. So on that, no, it makes it so much more, I mean. Well, it's fascinating for me. I mean, one of the reasons I love this job in this conference, I did it last year, is I get to have a conversation with you. I can sit and listen to your presentation, and that's wonderful. But if I can sit and have a conversation, how much better it is for my learning? Oh, no, I, 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 no I, I, I feel the same when they ask. The only question I had is, where is this being used? And then when I was told, and then they gave me links to how it's being used, I said, oh, this is really neat. Here. We're really hoping to, to continue to build a resource. Well, I was so pleased to be invited because I'd heard about the program, 
And then, of course, well, you may have heard the story. I was invited and I said at first, uh, I can't do it. I'm speaking in Winnipeg Thursday and Friday. And, and then you said it was your wife's birthday. Right? And then it was my wife's birthday. I hadn't even mentioned that part because that's why I really can't, I really have to spend the day. Uh, but so I'm gonna go, well, I have another uh, talk to give. And then what happened was I, I checked, I said, there is a United flight that leaves Winnipeg, get me to Chicago, get me in at, to Logan at 1230. And that's, oh, I, but that's where they even suggested I live in Needham, they said, stay at the hotel. It's only t yeah. 10 minutes, which was fine. So oh, so I, you're local, I didn't realize. Oh yeah, I, I, I live in Needham. I live in Newton. Oh, right next door, yeah. I know I was in McLean for years, so, but I usually, I, I mean, I, I'd go home, but they said, by the time you go in, go home and then drive back, we'll, we'll, we don't, they said, we usually don't put up people who are local, but in this case, they, which really worked out very well, so. Great. Okay.